everyone, this is uh, Edward Zier here and I'm very, very lucky to be with an amazing uh, entrepreneur and businesswoman by the name of Marianne Barakat. Marianne Barakat is visually impaired and has 3% of her vision in her left eye. Is that right, Marianne? That's right, Ed. Absolutely. And say hello to the audience, uh, Marianne. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey. And look, it's, it's, this is a very, very, um, I've done quite a few interviews in my time, but as a marketing mentor and also business commentator, to me, this interview has that next level of prowess because I've been very, very lucky to meet Marianne Barakat and work with her. And Marianne Barakat is a woman who, again, I don't want to tell her story. I want her to tell her own story, but she lost her vision in very tragic circumstances. And she's actually one of the happiest people I know. One of the, is that a fair comment? You're a happy person? <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's very fair. Yeah, and where Marianne's at is Marianne is helping people with their mindset motivation, also visually impaired people. So enough about me, Mar Marianne. Tell the audience a little bit about you. Tell us your story. How did you become this amazing person today despite what happened? Okay, try and keep it short. Well, um, take your time, Marianne, shoot. I, uh, I lost my vision about just over 10 years ago. Um, happened all of a sudden. I was at work, um, had taken some medication basically that didn't didn't go well. Um, I began to hemorrhage and my retinas detached and developed diabetic retinopathy because I am a diabetic. So what does that mean? So were you like born a diabetic or whatever? No, I've been a diabetic. I was uh, diagnosed at four. So yes. I have juvenile diabetes. Yes. Yeah. So it's... And you took what medication? What, what happened? What exactly happened? You were at work and... Yeah, I was at work. I was actually a preschool teacher, which I absolutely loved. Um, and it was morning tea, and I remember holding the tray with cups full of water. And I was walking outside to give all the little kitties their water, and all of a sudden there was just a burst of blood. And within an instant, it all just happened from then. So what happened? So you were just living your life. You were a preschool teacher. I was a preschool teacher, yep, yeah, which like I mentioned, absolutely loved. Um, I was in my element. I had just recently gone and married. I had just gotten back from my honeymoon actually a month before that. Um, just moved into a new house. Everything was going really well. And then all of a sudden just bang. So uh, going back, so what happened? So you were taking this medication and it was it something to do with your diabetes? What actually caused this reaction? It was. The medication that was prescribed to me by a specialist um, was actually not suitable for diabetics, which I didn't know. Coming from a specialist, I thought he knew what he was giving me, but obviously it had a reaction to the diabetes and it caused my eyes to hemorrhage. So did you instantly go blind? Within a split second. <laughs> my God. It's, yeah. yeah, it's... Within a split second. Was it what ha was it painful? Or did what actually did you feel at that moment? If you no, don't mind me asking. No, of course not. I, I didn't feel anything. It was more of um, seeing the blood on the inside. It was like um, you know those horror when you watch those horror movies and you've got the blood trickling down the walls and yes, that's pretty much what I could see on the inside of my eye and that's straight away I knew something was not right. And what that was? What, how old were you then? I was twenty three at the time. So in that instant, your life just changed. Within an instant, yep. Going Turned back. 360. I mean, it's funny. I mean, obviously we've spoken before this interview and it's, it, it, I sort of get the impression that as of that day, your life became a before and after. You know, that was the D-day of your life. Is that a fair sort of way of looking at it, you think? Yeah, definitely. There was a before and then an after. Um, it does take, you know, losing a part of, you know, whether it's your eyes or your hearing or whatever it is, you do lose a part of yourself. Yes. Um, you know, your, your everyday routines, everything that was certain before, just everything's just become so uncertain. Um, you know, all the little things you used to do before, whether it was going to the bathroom to wash your hands, getting something out of the cupboard, um, walking down to a friend's place, everything just becomes so uncertain and everything just changes. Wow, wow. So I was going to say, what happened afterwards? So, you know, what happened the day that this happened? You, what was it, what was it, take, take us 
take the, us and the audience through the process. What did you go through? Being the person that I am, um, this would have happened at about, I'd say about 10.30 in the morning. And I didn't mention it to anyone. <laughs> I just kept going. I kept working. Um, and I was actually asked to stay back at the end of the afternoon. And I just looked at my boss, which was the first time I'd ever said no. And he said, he was kind of shocked. You know, what do you mean you're saying no? You've never said no before. And I said, look, I can't, I can't see. And he just kind of looked at me and said, what are you doing here? You know, go, 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 do what you need to do. So I left, drove home, mind you, to my mum's place at the time. She was only around the corner. I said, call the optometrist quick. Something's not right. Something's wrong. I can't see. So I went down there and he just had a look and he said, you've got to go down. You've got to go down to the hospital. And he gave me the name of a specific specialist that he said to me, this is who you need to see. Um, so off we went. And the whole time here I am thinking, oh, you know, they can fix this, they can fix this, it's okay, it'll get fixed. Um, we spent pretty much the whole night waiting to see this doctor and he had left. And pretty much no one else would touch me, no one else would go near me. It was that severe, which I didn't know at the time. None of the other specialists would, would even have a look. So this so special, he, was an, he was an elite. Oh, they sent you home? They sent me home. Um, they said, though, not to lay down, not to sleep. Even while I'm sleeping, I had to sleep sitting up. Um, and to come back and, you know, ironically come back and see this same doctor. They mentioned this same doctor that was mentioned to me, which is Dr. Andrew Chang, who's just absolutely amazing. Um, and yeah, I came home, went back on Monday and it all just went from there. Had really, really intense laser for a while. Um, and he had said to me, this is gonna take a little while. He said, it's not gonna, it's, you're going to be in for a rough ride. Here I am thinking it was a couple of months. Ten years later, here we are. Um, in and out of surgery. I've had probably over 60 of them. You've been... Up to this day. What, as in you've been, what, anaesthetised under the knife 60 times? Mm. Yep, yeah, and wow. it, it doesn't, <laughs> let me tell you, it doesn't get any easier because the anaesthetic doesn't, wear as, doesn't uh, work as well as it used to. So you start to feel and, you know, pain and all that kind of thing. So it's not, not pleasant. Wow. Wow. So you were 23, you started going through this process and as you before, you, how much vision do you have now? Because it's, you, you seem to be able to move around and you can see me. So tell me exactly what you can see now. Like, and and what, well, it's 10 years later, is it? 10 years later, 10 yeah. Years, sorry to tell the audience that your age. Yeah, oh no, don't worry. <laughs> 33 and feeling like I'm 20, it's yeah. all good. <laughs> yeah, just uh, note for the audience, Marianne does not look a day over 24. So oh, thanks, Pete. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose the question is, so what do you see now? What do you actually see when? Um, well, my right eye's completely, completely blind, so I have no vision in there. Hmm. Um, my left eye, I do only have 3%. It is only tunnel vision, so it's just what's in front of me. Yes. Um, and it's like you've smothered my eye with Vaseline and I'm looking through Vaseline. So it's very murky, very unclear. Yeah. Yeah. But you can, what can you see of me? Like, uh, you know, as I'm sitting in front of you. At the moment, Ed? Yeah. I can see the skin on your hand flapping around. No worries. So you can see my hand all right. <laughs> I can see your hand. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because of the lighting, everything else is just white. Absolutely. And no offensive gestures at all. I'm not giving you, I'm giving you a thumbs up. Nothing, you know. Okay, it takes that. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, I'm not giving you the fingers. I think you're wonderful. Thumbs up. Double thumbs up. Well, and look, I, you know, obviously it's an amazing story. And I know you said you were married at I was. the time. Yeah, i just come back from my honeymoon yeah. a month a month prior to that. So... What happened there? Um... I mean, I guess it must have been hard coming back from the honeymoon, starting a whole new life, and then all of a sudden all this, all this is going on. Um, three years later, we just, the marriage just ended. He just turned around and said, I don't love you anymore, and that was the end of it. Wow. Wow. And how long were you with him for? We were actually best friends since the age of 10. So, wow. yeah, we knew each other inside out. I mean, I don't, I haven't, I've never held any grudges. Um, you know, I pretty much respect him for staying around for the three years. He helped me get through a lot. Um, 
yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, that's how things panned out. Wow. Wow. What, uh, you know, that's amazing. I mean, even me interviewing, that's, uh, I'll be straight with you, that yeah. is a shocking thing to hear. You know, your story is, I mean, I've got a sob story. Your story is real trauma. You've got some sort of real things compared to most of us. My life doesn't even barely compare to yours. I wouldn't even try. How did you get through it? How did, you know, take us through it. The day your husband said, hi, Marianne, I don't love you anymore. What went through your mind? What happened to you in that moment? Oh, that was, I have to say, I don't know which day was worse, the day that I lost my eyesight or the day where he, where he left. Um, it actually took me a couple of years to get over that. I needed my time to myself. Um, I spent a lot of time listening to my music, reading, um, just within those two years, they kept, everyone just kept telling me, you've got to get out there, you've got to get out. And, and I just wasn't ready. I knew within myself I wasn't ready. I needed time. Mm. And I just, I, I never, I don't know whether it helped with the process, but I, I was never angry. Mm. I never did get angry. Um, I think that helped the healing of that part of my life was not being angry. I think that just would have added fuel to the fire. How um, did you not be angry? I mean, I've had way less happen to me and I've been furious. How did you not be angry? What's, how did you do that? Um, look, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy situation. It was very hard on, on everyone, not just myself, on my ex-husband, on my family. Um, and I don't know, he stuck, he, he was, he was there for three years and at the end of the day, he just, I guess, couldn't, couldn't deal with it. So that was, I mean, that's his, that's his choice. Mm. He never, never did anything towards me besides leave. Um, so I didn't have anything to hold against him but that. I mean, he was great the whole way through. Mm. So I guess it's just a part of who I am as well. That's just how I work. So you were <laughs> able to let it go. You were able not to hold a grudge. Yep. You were able to get over, uh, you know, because, again, I know plenty of people, me included, that have had relationships break up in much more superficial circumstances by contrast. And they're torn up inside. And I think there's something going on here. I think there's something quite unique about you. How did you heal after, you know, you know, you lost your eyesight, your husband left you? What was the resolution process? What did you go through to become the positive inspirational person you are today? Um, I mean, you have spoken about this before, but I have to put a lot of it down to faith. Um, I do have a lot of faith and I guess that's sort of what kept me going. So you believe in God? Very much so. Okay. I have a lot of faith. Yep. Wow. And that just, that grew, my belief grew and I just put my hands in the hands of God. Um, I've never, never asked and never wanted to ask why this has happened. I mean, I'm a big believer of things happen for a reason. Um, and this has obviously happened for a reason, and I'm, I think I'm starting to get a, to get an idea of what my purpose is in life now. I think I think, I think I'm starting to get that too. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it just I mean my my family were great support. Having my nephews around, yes, was just a miracle for me. That everything everything that I did, I used to get up every day and because I actually um, helped raise my nephew. So that was sort of thrown on top of things. Um, and having to get up for him every day was pretty much a saviour for me. So, so while you, you, know, you were, so you were vision impaired, you were blind. Yep. And you put a lot of it in your faith, your Christi Christian faith. Yes. Your Christian, Christian faith. faith. So what was it like basically saying, what was it like putting your faith in them? How could you just let go of the physical reality of what you're dealing with? 
and give so much trust to, to your creator. How does that work? I mean, I, have, I personally, I haven't even enough, have enough trouble trusting God that much. How did you develop such a strong bond with uh, God and your creator? Um, I've all, I mean, I've grown up in church and, you know, my, my parents go to church and I've, I've grown up being a Christian, so I've always had that faith. But it was just when all this happened, I, I, something just clicked and I just, I just put myself in the hands of God and I said, I know you're going to look after me and do with me what you will and I know you're going to look after me, nothing's going to happen. So, you know, do as you please sort of thing and that's, that's just what kept me going and every time I had to overstep another hurdle, I'd just, I'd just pray and I'd just know that I was being looked after. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it just gave me like a real inner strength. Wow. Tell me more about this inner strength. What, what does this inner strength mean to you and what would it mean to someone else who's going through their own trauma in their own life? Well, let me tell you, my inner strength, I think, came from when I was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of four. Um, that was, I was actually diagnosed because I had gone through another traumatic experience. So having to go through that traumatic experience and then having to be put into hospital at four years old thinking that there's nothing wrong with you and I can still picture it in my mind that that, that minute that the doctor said I had to go to the hospital when I just went hysterical. Um, as a four-year-old? As a four-year-old, four yeah, old. just banging and kicking, just telling everyone that there's nothing wrong with me because physically from the outside there was nothing wrong. So I didn't know what was going on and I just, there's no, no need to go to the hospital, I don't need to go to the hospital. Um, and from, I think from then, just having to pick up the strength and do what I need to do and spend that time in hospital and have, you know, four injections injected to me, into me a day. And that strength just came from there. And then all of a sudden, when I lost my eyesight, that strength just, just came back. It's that, just that strength of knowing, you know, whatever happened, you can get through this. Wow. Wow. That's a... Uh... That's definitely amazing. I mean, so 20, at the age of 23, your life just changed instantly. And here you are. You're 33, but of course you don't look that age. <laughs> so I know what to say, you know, so I'm a seasoned <laughs> actually, yeah. Uh, what are you doing today? So tell me about what you're doing today. I mean, what are you doing with your life today? What is it? And you, you implied before, you know your purpose now. I do. What um, is your purpose? I have actually enrolled in a great community called TCI. Yes. Um, the Coaching Institute, which yes. you are aware of. And I'm starting to become a master practitioner coach. And my niche, what I want to do, what my vision is, is I want to get out there and work with visually impaired and blind people. Um, just helping them live a fulfilled life. Just letting them know that you don't need to be stuck in a corner. There is endless possibilities for you out there. Wow, wow. And you made reference to the TCI being the amazing community, the Coaching Institute. Yep. What is it that you like about the Coaching Institute? How is it that they've connected with you? Oh, the community is just amazing. I mean, from staff to students, um, great support. Yes. I mean, obviously, I need a bit more support than others with my visual impairment, sort of with reading documents, and they've just been amazing. They've just been really, really good. Wow, wow. And you're starting to become a, what, a master coach, did you say? Yep, yep, I am. And eventually want to get into um, public speaking side of things, um, holding my own seminars, just getting the message across, taking these public speaking and these seminars overseas because there are a lot of countries around the world where if you have a vision impairment, you're sort of stuck in a corner and that's the end of your life no matter how old you are. I mean, I love Australia and all, but isn't Australia like that as well? Not so much, no. Right, okay. I'm no. I'm completely ignorant to this. I'm... No. I mean, in, in terms yeah. of disabilities, yes. Australia is just amazing. Okay. It's amazing from, you know, your transport to your studies to employment, um, support, social support, emotional support. It's fantastic. Whereas you've got your other countries around the world where... Like I said, if you've got a visual impairment, I mean, being from Lebanon, being Lebanese, I know for a fact that Leban Lebanon is one of these countries where if I was living there, I would have been stuck in a corner right now. And um, What do you mean stuck in a corner? What, do you, what, you 
What, they put you in a home or something? What would they do to you exactly? No, you're pretty much stuck at home. I mean, you know, your life's over. You can't work. You can't socialise. You can't, I mean, you can't see. How are you going to do all that? How are you going to do all that? Yeah, so if you can't see. They take you out of, <laughs> so are you saying that they take you out of society? Pretty much. Wow. Pretty much. And the message I want to bring across is to these visually impaired people and their families and just everyone in the community is that that's... that's that's not what it's about. I mean, there's endless possibilities. I mean, you can't see. I mean, there's a quote which I love and I always quote by Caroline Cassie and it's, I never needed sight to see. All I needed was vision and, oh, what was it? All I needed was vision. Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember it now. So she was, mental block. So she, oh, that's all right, we'll get there. It's not, it's not like you're being interviewed and this is going to go, you know, on national television. It's a... Uh, so she's vision impaired, she's blind. She is visually impaired and she's someone that I really look up to. She does a lot of public speaking and um, brings awareness to a lot of people. Wow, wow. Yeah. So part of your purpose is to what, help other people in your predicament. Yes. Or Indeed. let me rephrase it, who who perhaps the, the D-Day has just happened to them, that critical event has just happened to them. Yep, definitely. I mean... I remember when I first lost my eyesight and knowing what I know now mm. would have made things a lot easier. Wow. Would have made things a lot easier. And what I want to do is that I want to bring that awareness to people that there are ways of, it's the choices you make. Yes. It, it made me realise it comes down to the choices that you make. It's not the situation, it's the choices and how you choose to deal with it. Um, and that's the message I want to bring across and I want to help um people in this situation, I want to help them make the right choices and the right decisions. That's absolutely amazing. And, you know, this is a fair comment. I'm sure anyone uh, who knows you in the real world or has met you uh, <laughs> face to face would attest to this fact is, I mean, you're, uh, you're visually impaired and you've been through, you know, a, you know a terrible circumstances when it came to your own marriage and your, your husband leaving you. But you're the, one of the most positive people that I know. I know people which have, you know, in a material sense, in a physical sense, that have everything, but they don't have the happiness or the grounding or the morale that you have. Yep. I know I've asked this question again, but I just want to dig that a little bit deeper. Yep. In short, how can you be so happy? And, I, and I'm, again, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I'm really yeah, taking a superficial cool. societal angle. So please, please, audience, or uh, Marianne, please don't think I'm being superficial. But how can you not have what society considers happiness and yet be so happy? Well, you want to ask that question, what is being happy? I mean, I'm, I've grown. I have to say I've grown since this situation. I have grown. Um... I've really come to learn who I am and what I want out of life. Um, and I guess I'm happy in the sense that you start, you, you just start, I mean, I, yeah, I can't see, but you teach yourself to use other tools to see. And I mean, I'm not just talking about, I mean, yeah, obviously there's touch and there's hearing, but you start to feel from the inside. Feel from the inside? Yeah, you start to feel from the inside. So. Um, you just, I mean, for example, the, the judgment, I mean, I've learned to let a lot of that judgment go. I mean, looking at people, um, I start to understand, I've, I've just got a heightening lock of understanding of a lot of things. Your sense is just in that kind of, that sense heightens. You just feel things on a whole different level. If that makes sense. Now, question, that's not because you're visually impaired. That's because of the choices you made. That's right. That's because of the choices I've made. I mean, I could have chosen, again, to, to sit in my room and, and, and cry and and not do anything. You know, my, I can't see, so I can't do this. Yes. No, there's not the choices I've made. I've, I've realised that there are choices. And yes, I may have to do things a little bit differently. Yes, things may be a little bit slower but I can do them regardless. Um, and you just sort of open yourself up to that and you just, things just start to happen. You just change, you just form, you grow and you just become really comfortable with who you are. And, and that's obvious. I remember the first time I met you, 
I got it immediately. You are comfortable with who you are. You know who you are. You know what you're doing. You have a purpose in life. And, and I say it again, there's very few people in society which are fully physically able that have nowhere near, I mean, here's an ironic statement, is you might be visually impaired blind, but you've got vision, more vision than most people I've ever met. <laughs> well, in a sense, yes. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you because there's, I mean, there's things that I can't, that I see and sense that people with vision can't see. Yes. If that makes sense. What kind of things can you sense? Like, how does this heightened senses work? What does that involve? Um, it does, it does work with, with physical objects. I mean, I can feel things when they're around me without even knowing they're there or without touching them. Um, but it's more on a deeper level, more of um, your intuitive side, if that if that makes sense. Just picking up on picking up on people's feelings and uh, people's emotions and understanding. It's just it really heightens because so you got to, you, you you can't see people's reactions. You can't you got to feel them. So, so that just starts to build up. So, so question, and I'm sure you nail it. What am I feeling right now? You're smiling. Oh, yeah, you're not yeah. smiling now. Before I was smiling, what was I feeling? What were you feeling? Yeah, before I was smiling. What, what was the emotion you're getting from me using your heightened senses? You were probably, oh, I don't know how to explain it. I can actually feel it. Is that it, make sense? It, I can feel it. I can feel it. Try me. I'm curious. I'm getting some free advice from you now. You should send me an invoice. Um, yeah, yeah I should, shouldn't I? Yeah. Ouch. Scratch the bill today. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, oh, no. Um, oh, you were... Uh, I don't know how to explain. Uh, you know, let me try. It's going to take time. We're gonna, That's all right. Um, it's, um, the internet and uh, anyone listening will wait. Please wait, everyone. Please wait. Yeah, just, uh, My intuition's coming up here. Yeah. Please wait. Yeah. Um, you were smart. I guess it's a sense. I don't want to say. I, it, not pride. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. Um. No, you're actually spot on. Am I actually I? was feeling it a is? sense of pride. Oh. I was actually feeling very grateful for the opportunity to be having this conversation with you. There you go. So I was actually feeling, <laughs> I was feeling pride like, wow, I'm very, I, I, being straight up with you, I'm very lucky to be sitting in the presence of an amazing person like yourself. Thanks, Ed. And I think being part, I, was, I feel very lucky to be here to be able to help tell your story by, you know, interviewing you and just digging that little bit deeper into how your mind works and what happens to you. Thanks, Ed. And I think it's amazing your heightened senses uh, are obviously quite paramount and I think definitely in the line of work you're going to, that'll work out quite well for you. Yeah. So I suppose my question to you is, is that with everything that's happened to you, mm -hmm. where to from here? What are your next moves? You talk about speaking and all that. What are you plotting next? What, 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 what's coming into mind for you to carry out your very clear life purpose? Okay, well, I want to start off with working one-on-one. -on -one yes. To start off with, with um, visually impaired people and their families as well, just bringing awareness to their families. I mean, it is very hard. I mean, I've been through it. It was very hard on my family, whether it be my brother or my parents or at the time my ex-husband, um, just in terms of dealing with their own emotions and everything that's happened. Um, so working one-on-one. -on -one, yes. Um, eventually I want to get into workshops Very and good. seminars where I, can do some, where I can do group work, whether it be again with the families or with the visually impaired. Yes. Um, and then my bigger goal, my bigger vision is to actually, like I said before, is to move this overseas, to get into the public speaking, to get into the seminars to get, and take that overseas and just bring awareness to everybody. Wow. Wow. So yeah. as I do this interview on February the 12th, 2014, mm -hmm. I think definitely watch this space will be very interesting uh, seeing where you all go from here. Yes. I'll be waving to you from, from Spain or from Europe or from somewhere. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. And we're just having the ironic conversation. We know that uh, underway, the, um, the researchers and governments that are working on cybernetic eye implants and that sort of thing. So yes. So what's the goal? It's we need to make you lots of money first and so then you can get an implant later on. That's right. 
Yeah, but by then you won't need your eyesight back anyway because you already see everything through your intuition, right? That's, yeah, exactly. I'll be telling them, oh, it's okay, you can give it to someone else. I'm fine the way I am, thank you. <laughs> and i just got to say, I think, um, thank you for letting me be part of the story. I was just going to say, what comes into your mind? What is a message you really want to impart onto the audience, be it people who can see physically that want to work with you and be it people that have gone through what you want to go through, what do you want to tell the audience out there? What's a big idea you want to impart on them? Um, I mean, I know I said it before, but to me, a huge, a huge part is understanding and knowing that you have the choices. You do have the choice to make how you're going to deal with it and where you're going to take your life. Wow. Wow. Yep. That's very compelling. And I must say, on that note, thank you, Marianne. It's been one amazing interview. Thank you, Ed. I feel very privileged to tell your story. And um, but depending on whoever you are reading this or hearing this uh, amazing interview, you've heard it uh, yourself from Edward's ear, make sure you type Marianne Barakat into Google and see what comes up. And uh, watch the space. I can uh, look forward to seeing you up on stage very soon. Yes. Definitely. This is Edward Zier <laughs> signing out. Goodbye, everyone, and goodbye from Marianne. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for listening.